Good evening, beloved. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us this evening. Last summer, I was privileged to be able to be with a couple of different uh, groups of kids going to camp. One of them was up at Subtle Lake Camp up in uh, our neck of the woods here, and the other one was at Camp Magruder on the coast of Oregon. And there was a couple of moments that were particularly meaningful for me during our time together with these young people. The first happened when uh, we were getting toward the end of our first camp, and there was a moment when in the curriculum it suggested that we offer the communion to the campers. And so we, we went ahead and did that, and I had this real sense of, of disconnect during that service of communion because I realized there were kids there who had absolutely no idea what we were doing. And so I asked if the next morning we could do communion over again. And this time I would try to help the, the campers understand a little bit about, about this uh, the special ritual that we do that we call communion or the Lord's Supper or Eucharist. And when I went to my second camp then over at the coast of Magruder, then I made sure that when it was time to do communion, that I did the same thing. Because I realized that even though it's a ritual that many of our young people or, or any of our adults may have done many, many, many times uh, over the years, that there are sometimes moments when you just wonder, do I really understand what it is that we're doing when we do communion? So this evening, we're going to, uh, because we have to do this as if we were doing it for the first time, because indeed this is the first time I've ever done communion this way, um, I'm going to take us back a few steps, and we're going to talk just a little bit about communion before we receive it together. Now, I sent written instructions to those of you on our email list about what I wanted you to bring together this evening. Um, so I'm going to give those instructions again, and if you have not had a chance to prepare for this meal together, I'm going to give you uh, just a couple minutes to turn off the, our little video and to go and prepare. But before I do that, let me uh, instruct you on what we're going to do. Now, in normal circumstances, we would have perhaps a common loaf or perhaps individual loaves of bread, and we would have... Uh, the grape juice or the, the fruit of the vine. Uh, in this circumstance, I, I don't expect anybody to, to go do special shopping to make sure that they have all the right ingredients, that they have the right kind of bread. Uh, when Jesus came together with his disciples, they were sharing a meal. And at the end of that meal, Jesus took things that were on the table and he prepared this moment for his disciples with the things that they already had. So I'm going to suggest that if you have uh, a loaf of bread, maybe a favorite cracker, maybe there's some special thing that you're fixing this week as you prepare for an Easter meal, I'm going to suggest that you get that. And I, I would also suggest that um, put it on a plate or a dish that has some personal meaning for you. In this particular case, I've had this little glass uh, plate for many, many years. So it's not a patent. It's not uh, the regular communion utensils we're going to use today. We're going to use something that I had in my own home. Now, now, I cheated a little bit because I knew I was doing this, so I made my own bread. But it can be a cracker. It can be any kind of bread. Um, just get that ready and, and prepare that. And then I hope that you'll also make a, a special uh, pretty place for it, a, a place where we can sit together for a moment and celebrate this really special moment together. So here's the bread. And in this case, also, I, I chose some really pretty tiny little uh, cordial glasses. These are something that a friend of mine found years ago in an antique shop. And so um, I don't use them very often, but today I thought it would be a good occasion to do that. So if you have grape juice, then I'm going to invite you to pour some grape juice in a little uh, glass, or it could be a cup, or it could be a favorite mug. I'm going to ask you to pour whatever beverage you have handy. It can be water, it can be orange juice, it can be ginger ale, whatever it is that you've got right on hand. So as we prepare for this moment, um, if you haven't had a chance yet to set these things out, I'm going to invite you to do that right now. So you can stop the video just for a moment. Welcome back. So we have ourself prepared. We have, oops, yeah, I'm going to spill myself here a little bit. I'm going to put my glasses so you can see them. That's my pretty little 
cordial glasses. And I have my homemade bread that I, I learned to make bread many years ago um, up at a, a monastery when I was going on retreat and I was so fascinated. It was a silence retreat and the, the person who was in charge of the retreat would every day she made these beautiful, enormous loaves of homemade bread and we ate our meals all in silence. So she would make us these fabulous meals and the bread would go uh, pry to place right in the middle of the table because she was really well known for her great bread and they'd be enormous they'd be about this size and then she would just stick this great big knife right in the middle of them and it was just like whoa i don't care what else we have we've got pat's bread so i got interested in bread making uh, from pat and when i went home i started experimenting and trying to make bread and um, i have to admit that my first uh, hundred or so uh, incarnations of homemade bread were a little more brick-like than they might have been. And at the time I was going over on uh, Monday mornings, I would go to a tiny little convent outside of where I lived and uh, I would often bring them the homemade bread that I had made and they were so polite about it. <laughs> they would eat that really, really difficult, dense bread. But it was whenever we had that bread together, it was a holy meal. Um, all of us have experienced those holy moments that come when we are sitting around a table with people that we care about and sometimes even strangers. And when we're sharing uh, sometimes the most plain things imaginable, the most simple things imaginable, but because we're sitting in the circumstance and we're sharing what we have with one another, it becomes a sacred meal. Now, in uh, Christianity, communion has been argued about probably more than any other single thing, except maybe what day are we going to celebrate Easter? And the reason that we have argued about uh, communion for so many centuries is because we can't quite decide uh, what it all means and what happens when we pray, uh, what happens when we celebrate this meal. And just like many things in, within our faith community, we have opinions that go clear one way and clear the other. For some people, when we say the prayer of the Holy Spirit over the bread, when the priest says those words and rings that bell and, and burns that incense, then the actual bread and the actual cup become literally uh, transformed into the body of Christ that then enter into our bodies in a very real and literal way way. And at the very, very end of the spectrum, on the other side, are those who just believe that this is a symbolic memorial meal that we do together as the people of Christ to remember Christ until Christ comes again. And then there's all of the in-between. So you can imagine when we started talking about doing online communion, this raised some hackles with some people. The people were just not sure if this was an appropriate thing to do. So I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. Uh, with us doing this particular meal today. And then we're going to share it together. And if, if you can't call it communion because it isn't quite, uh, doesn't seem like the, the atmosphere is quite right, that's okay. Whatever it is you call it, we're going to share this meal together uh, with and through uh, and by our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus had this last meal with his disciples, it was in the context of the many, many meals that they'd already celebrated together. Uh, I could imagine that we're, we're told that the, the meal was prepared and served up in, the, in what was called the upper room. And I've always imagined that meanwhile, down in the bottom uh, floor of the, of the house, what the meal preparations were happening. So I'm imagining that the, the guys are all up there in the upper room and they're having conversation and they're talking about all the different things that have happened this week. And it's been an amazing week in Jerusalem as hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have come into the city and have begun the preparations for the Seder meal. So there would have been many sacrifices. There would have been uh, much smoke up in the air as the priest gave the sacrifice of the day. Uh, there would have been a lot of noise and a lot of commun uh, uh, commotion and a lot of people just moving around the city and a lot of families gathering and a lot of friends getting together. And maybe you'd see people that that was the only time of year that you'd ever see them. So it was a time of, of great excitement. Now, originally, of course, as, as we recall from um, the Old Testament, the Seder meal celebrated a particular moment in Jewish history. 
It was that moment in which they were driven out of the land of Egypt and into the desert. Uh, we could go through and we could talk about, as the Seder meal does, about um, all of the, the plagues of Egypt that happened because the Pharaoh was so resistant to let the people go, until finally a great plague happened where the firstborn son of each family was killed, except for those who had sacrificed a pure and unblemished lamb and put the blood of that pure lamb over the doorway of their homes. And if the angel of death saw the, the sign of that blood over the lintel of their homes, then they would know to pass over their homes and their children would be okay. And that's why we call that the Passover. One of the most important celebrations in the life of the Jewish people has always been the Passover because it reminds them, it remembers, it re-historicizes, uh, it re-encapsulates their main story, the story of how they were God's people and when before they were even known as a whole people in this moment of Passover, God took them out of slavery and brought them into freedom. And because of that, they were told that every single year you are to come home and you are to celebrate this together. Uh, so it's, it was a great feast. It was a, a lively time for people to be together. And I can imagine, as, the, as I was saying before, that the men were sitting in the upper room and the smells were wafting up all of those special dishes that were pre prepared at the time. And there's conversation and laughter and storytelling. And, and it was in this context then that after they ate the meal, and I, I love sometimes doing a, a Thursday night uh, meal together as we do a, a, a facsimile of a Seder supper, because I think having a dirty dishes on the table is exactly the kind of moment that we need to imagine in our minds. So after they are full and they've eaten and they've drank and they've told stories and they've said the prayers and they've sung the songs, at the end of all of that, then Jesus gathered them together for this special meal. Now, in the United Methodist Church, we practice something called the open table, open communion. And that means that you do not have to be a member. You do not have to be someone who has gone through confession. You do not have, someone, have to be someone who has done enormous preparation to come to this table. We come to this table because Jesus gave it to us to enjoy together. Wesley, John Wesley called it a means of grace, which means that we don't really understand this mystery of the bread and the cup, but Jesus invites us to the table as a way of giving us the gift of Christ's presence. And we don't know what work the Holy Spirit has in mind for this moment. We only know that God indeed has in mind this special gift of presence, of life, of forgiveness. Now, as we enter into the, the communion ritual, I'm going to take it out of the United Methodist Book of Worship. And because we uh, are not able to be together with hymnals and all of that, I'm going to just ask you to repeat after me. And Mike is here in the office, and he's going to be you, and I'll be me. And so he will, uh, he will be the repeat after me person. The Lord be with you, and also with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Repeat. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is a right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, O God Almighty creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. 
And I'm just going to say the phrases just in short phrases, and then you repeat after me. The first one is this, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When we had turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us in him your crowning gift, emptying himself that our joy might be full. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, beloved of God, he took bread. He gave thanks to you and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat for this is my body. And even when the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. And I invite you again just to repeat after me. Christ has died. Christ has died. I'm going to start that over again, and it's just fine. I'm going to just do one phrase at a time, and you will repeat after me. Christ has died. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with one another and one in ministry in all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Beloved, I invite you now to take of the bread. And if you are with family, then I invite you to serve one another. I'm going to ask Mike to come, and, and he's just, um, we didn't think about this part ahead of time, but he's going to come to my, uh, to my side here. And I'm going to serve him, and then he will serve me. So as I do this, uh, we do so knowing that, that Christ is our God, that Christ has come to give us life, and that the mystery of Christ is in this place. Thanks be to our God. Mike, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat.
And this is the cup of Christ poured out for you. For, you can actually just sip it if you want, because it's your cup. Nancy, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Amen. This is the cup of new covenant poured out in Christ's blood for you. Amen. Thanks be to Christ. Please take whatever time you need, even if you need to pause our video for a few moments. But as you are finished, I invite you to come return and let us say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We hope that this Holy Week is particularly special for you, beloved of God. We do have another service coming on Good Friday uh, in which we will uh, memorialize that uh, last day of Jesus as he gave his life for us. And then join us again on Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of our Christ together. Blessings, of, blessings and peace, beloved, and go with our God. Amen. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, what wondrous love So